gather round me, children, I'll tell you the news. Don't worry about the names or dates, you already know it's true. The doctor hates your baby, the prime minister's a ghost. And all them folks are sailing here, cause they're in love with both. Superfoods can save us from all our evil sin. JFK and Elvis own a bar in Wisconsin. And vaccinations were created by the CIA to steal votes from Bernie Sanders and turn your babies gay. So click the link you think you like and get tooled for a fight against those lefty fascist communists who are leaning too far right. And welcome to Not Another Fake Newscast, I'm Paul. And I am Jenny. This uh, this sort of mini episode is a little interview we did with a lovely man called Iyad El Baghdadi. It's also nearly an hour long, so you probably can't argue it's a mini episode. It's about 50 minutes <laughs> that we had this. It's a mini know. episode for us. But yeah, certainly. So this is a interview. This comes off the back of episode 13, where we discuss some of this. But this is um, a specific theory set. From a uh, from the the main proponent of it, yeah. Um, he had he had came up with a came up with a good analysis that we thought of a, a potential counter argument to the sort of mainstream narrative that Rex Tillerson was fired for his support of Britain in the wake of the the Russian spy poisoning fiasco. So as always, you can find us on uh, www. Dot not another fake newscast dot com. Yeah, you can find us uh, at PGMcast on both Twitter and Facebook, and you can get us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash PGMcast. Um, and you will find Iad El Baghdadi at, at Iad underscore El Baghdadi, all one word. We'll put the links in the show notes and stuff for this as well. And he is the author of a recent book which was called uh, The Vicious Triangle, Terrorists, Tyrants and the West. Indeed. So let's hear from Iad. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm here now with uh, Iyad El-Baghdadi, um, the, the man in question, um, whose who's sort of findings and stuff we've been looking at today. Um Hi, Yad. If you'd like to just give us a, a sort of brief introduction about about yourself and your work. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, I, I wear many hats, but I guess I'm here as uh, Yad, the uh, Twitter personality. So I am uh, kind of a casualty of the Arab Spring. I uh, became an Arab Spring activist uh, in 2011. Uh, at the time, I used to live in the United Arab Emirates. It was the only country I really ever lived in, even though I wasn't considered a citizen. And uh, against the background of my pro-democracy activism in uh, 2014, I was uh, 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 arrested, put in jail, and then uh, summarily expelled uh, from the country. Uh, eventually, I made it to Oslo, Norway, where I live right now and continue my work. Um and, uh, you know, on my Twitter account, uh, where I have, uh, I think now I have some, somewhere around 110,000 followers, uh, I have been posting analysis uh, related to uh, democracy and the Middle East and how the actions of, um, you know, Middle Eastern dictators uh, affect the world and affect uh, democracies. And uh, most recently, I think I was uh, kind of uh, commenting about how uh, two governments, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia's, uh, pushed for Rex, Rex Tillerson's um, uh, firing. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that's that, that's that's how we came across you. So I think in, in the aftermath of the of the sacking of Tillerson, it's fair to say that a lot of the the mainstream narrative there was was focused on um, the things that he had said about Russia and and in the moments you know in the days before um, his his firing via via Twitter, uh, but you you proposed a, a slightly a slightly different version of events which you know I think has a lot of credibility. Would you would you like to kind of talk us 
through the through that yeah i mean i i do believe that uh well first of all i think i'm 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 not really a fan of monocausal explanations when it comes to uh to to uh politics in general so i do believe that uh probably uh the thing about the russian uh poisoning was a factor probably maybe it was the you know the, the straw that broke the camel's back uh, but I also believe that there is a very strong case for why the United Arab Emirates government and the Saudi governments, particularly the United Arab Emirates, uh, has been a very strong impetus behind his firing. Uh, and so it is a, it's really a story about how these governments have been interfering or meddling into U.S. politics for years uh, maybe before it wasn't as blatant, but I think with Trump's election or with the prospect of Trump, uh, of a possibility of Trump becoming uh, U.S. president, uh, they really saw that as an opportunity and they really pushed for that and, and they're really uh, trying to make as much use of that as possible. And, and do you think uh, that there was a particular uh, reason for, for them wanting Trump so much? Is that to do with perhaps... Uh, his sort of business ties and business interests in those countries, particularly I know um, when I was living in in the Middle East and in, in the United Arab Emirates, he was uh, you know doing a lot of property development. There was Trump estates and, and and things like that were being developed over there. So do you think that's that's a that was a possible angle they thought they might be able to use for leverage with him? Well, I, I would actually say uh, I, I would I would say there's two reasons, um, and the first uh, maybe maybe three reasons. Well, the first reason I believe is that uh, they kind of have a romantic they, they kind of have a romantic memory of the Bush years, George W. Bush, uh, because that was a really golden period for them. That was a period in which the United uh, the United States and the Western world in general. This was post nine uh, eleven, and uh, the Western world in general completely dropped any pretense of caring about human rights because terrorism became the top of the agenda. Um, so this was a period, this was a, a really great period for them because the normalization of war and terror rhetoric, uh, is something that really, uh, extended their, uh, their rule. I, I would say extended by rule by maybe 20 to 25 years, because there's so many unsustainabilities inherent in their, uh, in a lot of these governments, but the war and terror rhetoric kind of like created a new, I could even say that over the past few years, they actually kind of constructed a new social contract based upon just war and terror. Uh, so they do, you know, remember Bush, uh, w, you know, George W. Bush fondly, and they thought with Trump that they're getting someone similar, someone who has ties to business, someone who is, uh, you know, uh, of course, a Republican, uh, and someone they have kind of a history of working with. As for the okay. second reason, I think that the second reason is that uh, dictators in general, I would say, have this um, have this idea that everyone is corruptible, everyone can be bought, uh, and they believe that about not just people uh, outside the West, but also politicians in democracies. That you know, it, it looks like a democracy, but then only the elites matter. And the elites can even the elites can be bought if you know if the price is right. Uh, so looking at Trump and seeing someone, they probably saw someone who looked so corruptible, uh, and someone they can bend to their will, someone they can actually use as kind of a you know like st I think uh, Steve Bannon described uh, Trump at at one point as a blunt instrument, if you remember. And I believe That's right, in the in the time interview. Yeah, and and I think they want to do the same. They, I mean, the, the plan is to use Trump as a blunt instrument, but towards uh, a different kind of region. Okay, yeah, sure, that, that that's valid. And and what would be the the, the third sort of string to that? Um, so if I want, if if you want me to run you through the timeline, um, so uh, and and I just noticed right now that uh, 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 Yusri Foda, who is also kind of another, I would say, another casualty of the Arab Spring. He's an Egyptian journalist who uh, had a very successful career in Egypt and now uh, lives and works out of Germany after, you know, it became impossible for him to continue his career in Egypt after uh, 2013. Uh, so I think he has also started digging into it, and I think he's about to release um, uh, some expose. 
but just to run you through the the uh, uh, the timeline very quickly. So I think uh, this was last week that we actually found out that Eric Prince, uh, who is a Trump supporter and who is the founder of Blackwater, uh, we found that he is a subject of the Mueller investigation. Sure, yeah. Uh, so Eric Prince also happens to be quite friendly with the United Arab Emirates because they have been looking, they have been actually uh, looking at Blackwater, not only Blackwater, but you know other companies or other uh, uh kind of security uh, service providers because they are really interested in building kind of a private army. Um, and this is something that we've seen. As we, like, there's a history to that because when you don't trust your own people because you're afraid of rebellions, you're afraid of, uh, you know, uh, uh, coups and rebellions and stuff, you want to actually have an army that you literally own. Um, so... Th- news have been kind of surfacing about a relationship between... Uh, the UAE is Mohammed bin Zayed. He, Mohammed bin Zayed is the crown prince, but he's basically the, the de facto ruler of the country. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are uh, news reports, if you if you care to look, uh, about how Blackwater was kind of providing this kind of private army uh, going back to 2011. Uh, and there might be actually there you might actually find things before 2011 as well. But 2011 is where when uh, the story broke in the New York Times. Um, it's also a fact that Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman has also been using Blackwater, but you know there has been some unconfirmed reports, uh, some leaks on certain Saudi uh, Twitter accounts saying that he asked them to leave the country uh, because he found out that they were kind of uh, you know sharing information with uh, with U.S. investigators. So anyway, Eric Prince. In uh, 2017, you know, there's the Seychelles meeting that I think uh, it's been in the media a lot. Basically, what happened is that the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, hosted a meeting or facilitated a meeting in January 2017. This was before Trump's inauguration. Yeah, Uh, this is that. This was the one. uh, There was a big story in the Washington Post, I believe, which covered this, right? I believe so, and I think it's not only the Washington Post. I think it was quite, quite, uh, you know, quite talked about in the media at the time. Uh, but I think the Washington Post uh, is at least the Washington Post link is the one that I read. Uh, but basically, this was a meeting that was organized by United Arab Emirates. Uh, we're we're kind of getting uh, reports about who was at the meeting, but we know that Eric Prince was there. Uh, we know that Russian officials w- w- were there. We know that UAE um, uh, intelligence officers were there. Um, and the meeting was basically attempting, or the, the purpose of the meeting seems to have been to uh, establish a back channel between Trump and Putin. Uh, and so Eric Prince is basically being probed right now by the Mueller, Mueller, the, by the Mueller team uh, to kind of ask more questions about this. Yeah, and there's there's definitely evidence that that Eric Prince was in and around Trump Tower and in and around the White House and in the sort of transition period. We know that obviously his sister Betsy DeVos is the the Education Secretary yeah, in the US right she's, now she's as well. She's actually his sister. Yeah, 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 she's Eric Prince's sister. Yeah, mm. and and we know we know that Eric Prince himself personally donated to to Trump's campaign, right? Yeah, he did. He's basically he's a big supporter of Trump, and he donated a lot of a uh, lot of money to his campaign. Uh, but you know, this opens the question of why was the UAE trying to establish this Trump uh, Russia back channel? Now, when I first read the news, I thought, kind of naively enough, I thought, oh, they they want to win favor with Trump because Trump has won the elections, and they wanted to kind of win favor with him and do him this favor, and uh, he wanted, you know, he wanted a a, a back channel to Putin. And they're like, yes, we'll do it for you. So I thought that the, the relationship with with uh, with uh, Trump only started after the election, like after he became president, after he was uh, he won the elections. Uh, but it appears that uh, uh, Robert Mueller is actually probing uh, something that's more sinister, which is that uh, there are claims that the UAE actually started illegally funding the Trump campaign in 2016. When before the elections, basically when it was still, sorry, when it was still uh, uh, candidate Trump rather than President Trump. Okay, sure. So, so uh, what what evidence is there of uh, of of the funds being channeled, or or where where do 
do we think that those funds have specifically came from? Um, well, apparently, um, I mean, of course, the the uh, uh, the evidence is not going to be released until I mean, it's basically up to Robert Mueller's team whether or when to or you know uh, how much evidence to release. But apparently, I, as far as I understand, it was funneled through um, uh, uh, a lobbyist who worked basically. He's this this guy called jo- George Nader who is uh, a lobbyist for the UAE and an advisor to Mohammed bin Zayed, who is, um, um, what do you say? He, he, he's, he's basically an American Lebanese uh, businessman who is close both to the Trump camp and to the UAE. And it, it appears that he has been instrumental in, all of, in, in a lot of these uh, communications. Yeah, I think George Nader has a uh, history with the US government. I think he was uh, involved during uh, the, the Iraq invasion and stuff in terms of facilitating business deals, uh, et cetera, in Iraq. So he's definitely tied in at high levels of government. So it's it's not uh, – and, and he has been investigated for, for lobbying claims uh, previously. So it's not too much of a stretch to, to su- suppose that he might have been involved in that. Well, he is being probed by the uh, by by the Mueller investigation himself, and he's he seems to be cooperating. So there's definitely uh, something there because you know, like uh, 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 he is he is being investigated by the Mueller team. Uh, interestingly, he's also a convicted pedophile, uh, and this is something that I mean, he's actually been convicted of uh, you know pay, paying uh, a check a young Czech boy for you know oral sex. Uh, so it's interesting to see that these guys are, uh, you know, they're not only corrupt, uh, but also they have this this dark angle as well that I find, you know, uh, very disturbing. Yeah, when people have those kind of dark past and dark histories, it makes them open to uh, corruption and open to blackmail, extortion, things like that, right? Absolutely, and I. Th- but I, th- I th- also think it also says something about their, their, uh, you know, their character in general. I think it's. Uh, when you feel that uh, you have so much power, I think it just affects the way that probably your brain works. Uh, but to you know, to, just just to back up a little bit, the UAE government wanted Trump to win and illegally funneled millions uh, into Trump's election campaign, uh, which is again, I mean, it's illegal for a foreign government to to fund uh, a basically a candidate. Um, so the question here, I mean, some people would, would point to this and say, you know, since the UAE has been trying to establish a back channel between Trump and, and Putin, doesn't this prove that this channel did not exist before and clear Trump's name from, you know, basically collusion charges and stuff? Uh, and I don't think that's the case at all, because uh, and, and this is the way that uh, this is my theory. My theory is that the Russians wanted Trump in the White House and they pushed in that direction. But once they had him in the White House, they needed a back channel to actually get him to do what they wanted. And I think what they most likely wanted was sanctions relief, uh, kind of like repeal of the Magnitsky Act, which is uh, a very effective uh, sanctions regime, which targets very specifically targets um, Russian elites, Russian kleptocrats who are uh, either working very closely with Putin or who are beneficiaries of uh, the Putin regime. Uh, You see, it's, you know, kleptocracy is very, like dictatorship, uh, kleptocracy is the business model of dictatorship. Uh, The one thing that people miss about dictatorship is that it is very, very, very profitable if you're the dictator. Um, And, but, you know, the... Those guys, the, those guys, the kleptocrats, they don't really want to keep their money in Russia or in a dictatorship because, first of all, you can't really make a lot of uh, return on investment over there. And then someone else might come around and steal your money. Uh, they want to spend their money outside the, the their own country. They want to store it outside their country where nobody can steal it. And they want to use Western democracies, which have you know highly advanced economies. They want to use them as a big money laundering machine. Yeah, um, and, and, and uh, you know, there's there's lots of evidence of that uh, in London, particularly. We know the, the, it's, it's the oligarch city of choice at the moment. Absolutely, and I think this is we're kind of seeing that uh, this there's a, there's a price to pay. There's a political price to pay when you allow them to do that. Uh, you're kind of encouraging them to create more instability, to create more uh, you know more security problems for you. 
So you think that oh let them let them invest their money you know you know don't ask don't tell, but eventually you know you you let them do that for a while and all you you know eventually you can see them meddling in, in your democracy, and you know assassinating people in your soil and releasing nerve agents etc. So this is there's a price to pay eventually when you allow dictators to run wild. Yeah, yeah, it's all well and good taking uh, donations to your party, as as you know. There's plenty of evidence that the Tories have been taking donations from Russian businessmen, but there's a price to pay for that, and and they're paying for it at the moment. Yeah, so so most probably what they wanted, uh, what they wanted, what the Russians wanted from um, uh, from uh, uh, Trump was repealing the Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, because they really hurt. I mean, they really hurt them because, you know, he's, you know, they're making all this money, but they're no longer able to store that money or to enjoy it in Western capitals. They want to live in Paris and they want to like travel to London and they want to, you know, uh, have ski vacations and, you know, have uh, you know, mistresses in the West uh, or have their mistresses live in the West, etc. So, you know, the, the moment you cut that off, you're actually really messing with their business model. And so that's actually most probably what they want. So, so we know we know what what Russia are looking to get out of that. They're looking to to get the sanctions lifted, and you know there was certainly a lot of talk in the, in the media that that was something that, that Trump w- was looking to build bridges with Russia. That was one of the bargaining chips that he had. What what I would ask you is what what do you think uh, Trump would, stands to benefit from that arrangement? Um, I, I think first of all, Trump is quite corruptible because he has. Uh, business, you know, business interests all over the world. Uh, it's interesting that some of his supporters actually say that that's why he's not corruptible because oh, he already has a lot of money. Why does he want more? But I think that kind of dismisses the mentality of someone who is, uh, you know, who is profit motivated. Uh, but I think on top of that, I think it's sim- it's really a hunger for power. Uh, you know, Trump is not uh, a dictator in a sense that he was elected. Uh, but he he definitely has uh, a lot of the marks, basically in, in terms of mentality, in terms of worldview of a dictator. Yeah, I, I think I think that's evidenced as well by the fact that you know you never you never really hear Trump saying anything negative about a lot of dictatorial regimes. You know, he's been very complimentary about Putin in the past of Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, you know, I think it, it appears that there's. There's things about these people that Trump admires. I think he uh, perhaps admires the level of power that they have, and that they don't have, uh, you know, democracies meddling in the things that they would like to do. Right? Oh, absolutely. He does. He he kind of. Uh, you almost feel like he envies the kind of power that comes with a dictator, and he actually admires a strong leader. Uh, and I believe he actually aspires to be a strong leader in a way. So that that's the image that he sold of himself. So it kind of tells you about what he want, probably what he wants to be. Uh, so of course, I mean, U.S. institutions are strong enough to hopefully strong enough to uh, to uh, withstand uh, four years of Trump, even though he is doing a lot of long term damage. Uh, but what about the rest of the world? What about the Trump's effect when it comes to the Middle East? Uh, because these guys are not checked by any kind of constitution or any kind of you know uh, human rights law or any kind of uh, you know. Uh, 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 active, you know, pushback from their citizens who they, you know, actively subdued. Yeah, so in, in a way, you're you're relying on outside influences to to pressure them towards uh, democratic behaviors or, or or improving their human rights records, things like that, right? Exactly. I mean, they don't have an incentive right now to actually act responsibly. So what happened is that. And the problem really goes back to the Obama years because Obama decided to kind of withdraw U.S. influence from the region. But I think he did it. I mean, and, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that as a as a as a goal. But I think he did it in quite a haphazard way, in ways that actually made things worse, because the moment you give space to these guys, uh, kind of like the responsible adult has left the room and you have all of these dictators running wild, running amok. Uh, and doing whatever they want. And what they create is basically crisis after crisis. It's a crisis factory, really. Dictatorships are crisis factories. So, uh, and and the, the biggest crisis that has happened in the Middle East uh, during Trump's tenure uh, would be the Qatar crisis. 
absolutely. And I, I, if 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 I would walk you to uh, uh, like basically walk you through a timeline of the crisis, starting from uh, after Trump's election. Uh, so it apparently, I mean, so so Trump wins the election in November, and in December, the United Arab Emirates uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed actually visits the uh, the United States, uh, but he does not tell. Obama. Obama was still president. So, you know, Obama, you know, he's kind of uh, served his term, but he's still a president until June, uh, 20, sorry, January 20th. Uh, so he, visit, he, he visits the United States, but he doesn't tell Obama that he's visiting Trump. And he actually visits Trump in Trump Tower, and the meeting uh, was uh, kind of leaked. Uh, and Flynn was there, Bannon was there, George Nader was there, and uh, the UAE's ambassador to the US, Yusuf al Ataiba, was also there at this meeting. This was December fifteenth. Yeah. So what? So what they did there is completely against diplomatic protocol, right? Yeah, it's not illegal, but it's against protocol. It's uh, and it's of course it's very suspicious. Yeah. Uh, so that's December. Uh, that's December, and and then you know in January you have uh, uh, the inauguration. And during the inauguration, apparently, this is when George Nader actually starts meeting uh, some people who are going to be very important uh, for the story. Uh, right after the inauguration, and there, there, there's there's this piece that was posted in Politico in uh, February 2017. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I don't I don't remember when the piece itself was posted, but it was describing events from February 2017. And describes how the United Arab Emirates ambassador to the U.S., uh, whose name is Yusuf al Otaiba, was in almost constant phone and email contact with Jared Kuch- Kushner. So there was very intense lobbying going on, and uh, uh, there's even news. You know, like one of the one of the first things that Trump did, and this was like when Bannon was still uh, in the White House uh, advising him. One of the first things that was that that happened was the Muslim ban. Um, and the UAE at the time, even though it's a Muslim government, was very, very careful not to criticize Trump. In fact, they actually uh, issued a statement saying, uh, we're fine with this. It is not against Islam. It's not anti-Muslim, even though it's a Muslim ban. Yeah, so they've, they've endorsed that. Yeah, and it's not clear really why they endorsed it, uh, but I, I think it's simply because they don't want to uh, upset or anger Trump, and they want to make it very clear that you know they, they support him, whatever he does. Uh, there is this pattern that uh, Arab dictators get along very well with U.S. presidents who are, uh, you know, on the Islamophobic, uh, Islamophobic side. Uh, and I think I think that it kind of reflects, uh, you know, because the narrative that that those dictators sell is that uh, those our people are not ready for democracy. Our people are savages. Uh, you know, they're uneducated, blah blah blah, and uh, we should rule them because we're the enlightened bunch. Uh, so they have this very negative image about their own people, and they kind of sell this kind of negative image about their own people um, to the West. And uh, you know who is most willing to, uh, who is most likely to agree with them that you know those countries are basically a bunch of savages, and you need enlightened dictators. It's basically people who are rather Islamophobic. So they actually get along quite well with uh, with these kind of people. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's uh, it's 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 uh, counterintuitive, but but yeah, that 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 does. I mean, there's there's historical historical uh, examples of that in in, in the Bush regime and yeah. and George Bush Senior Reagan years. That there are time. These are times when uh, relationships between the U.S. and the the big uh, Islamic dictatorships have been strong. Yeah, I mean. Uh- the the George Bush years were kind of a golden golden era for these guys because the war on terror really was I mean re, they really love it and they still continue to use war on terror rhetoric as I said uh, and they really wouldn't miss the chance for a repeat and that's why you know Trump's vers- first ever visit first ever foreign trip was to Riyadh and this was in May 2017 and uh, uh, I remember at the time we had like pretty ridiculous uh, videos and images coming out. Uh, those guys, like they actually had uh, CC uh, uh, from Egypt also attend. Uh, also the Bahraini king, I believe, was there. Of course, Qatar was excluded at the, at the time, of course, very clearly. Um, 
so they kind of had Trump's ear, and they again, as I said, they're basically using him as a blunt instrument. Uh, but against who? I mean, they're mainly they wanted to use him against Qatar and Iran. Uh, Qatar basically was, you know, the little country they thought that, uh, you know, it would be quite easy to mo- mobilize uh, Trump again, or at least, if not get Trump's uh, permission uh, to uh, do whatever they wanted to do. Uh, sorry, if if not gets his support, then at least get his permission. So to to give us a bit of background, what what do you believe is uh, Saudi and the UAE's main issue with Qatar? What why why um why are they looking to sanction them and put them back in check? What is it that Qatar have done to offend them or to rile them? Well, the the back there's background to this going back to 1996, and some would argue actually older than 1996. Uh, but you know, having I mean, I, I I grew up in the country, so I remember in 1996 there was this um, uh, very important event uh, in modern Arab consciousness, which was uh, the launch of Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera was different because you know, and before satellite TVs, what we had was nothing but uh, but national TV stations, and national TV stations are um, you know completely controlled by the state. So with the with the rise of uh, satellite TV, you had uh, you know the average citizen could access news feeds and news channels, uh, which are not controlled by his own government. And at the, at, at, around that time, 1996 was when Qatar uh, founded Al Jazeera, and it was quite a um, um, a leap in consciousness, political consciousness, because they broached topics that nobody else would broach. Uh, and the, the, the state of the Arab world at the time being what it is, a lot of the people who are in the opposition found this to be, like in the opposition to Arab regimes, found this to be uh, quite a uh, an opportunity. And uh, they a lot of these uh, people in the opposition just happened to be Islamists, including Muslim Brotherhood, some Muslim Brotherhood linked or Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you know, influenced uh, 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 figures. So... Initially, it was really, really, they were really, really um, upset about Al Jazeera and about, you know, uh, this country, which is supposed to be their neighbor, uh, creating a disruptive uh, or funding a very, very highly disruptive uh, TV station. But they were also trying to tie this to, you know, we're against extre- extremism, we're against uh, Islamism. They, they, I don't think they started saying Islamism until later, but at that time, they were basically talking about uh you know uh uh, uh extremism uh, okay. so in 20 in 2003 as you know you remember 20, 2003 basically was the iraq war and there is a cable a wiki you know wikileaks cable released at the time so it released uh uh it was kind of recorded at the time it was released a lot, uh, uh, a lot later in which um, Hamad bin zayed actually mentioned something about how the U.S. should bomb Al Jazeera. Uh, right, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, so, the, so the, the strength of feeling that they had towards uh, the TV station and and, uh, and its influence on their people was was pretty pretty extreme. Uh, it's not only that. He was actually using the fact that uh, the, the U.S. Uh, army at the time was actually quite annoyed with Al Jazeera because of its coverage of the Iraq war. And, you know, Al Jazeera kind of took a very clear stance. Uh, of course, they're they're kind of uh, they're supposed to be independent and objective, but you kind of you always know that there is a kind of stance that a certain uh, 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 news platform takes. Yeah, so, and their editorial stance would was was against right. The Iraq. So it's generally exactly it was generally against the Iraq War, and uh, the U.S. Uh, administration at the time did take notice. And I think he was using the fact, oh, you're you're very irked with them. Why don't you just bomb them? So I, I have no idea whether it was serious or not, but it actually shows the level of enmity that uh, you know that they had towards it. This was 2003, like 15 years ago. Sure. Uh, with the start of the Arab Spring, um, Al Jazeera or Qatar in general had uh, you know a very uh, obviously was very pro-revolution. Um, Al Jazeera was an important, fa- uh, sorry, it was an important uh, voice for a lot of people who were uh, trying to get media attention for the social movements that were going on in 2011. 
uh, start of the Arab Spring. And of course, again, this was extremely annoying, extremely infuriating for Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Arab world, sorry, uh, 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 the rest of the Gulf states who were actually against, of course, against any kind of uh, idea of revolution. Yeah, it's a, it was a real concern for them, a genuine concern for them at the time. Uh, absolutely. And what happened over the next two years is that it became very clear that uh, uh, Al Jazeera was taking a very blatantly pro-Muslim Brotherhood stance uh, to the point that certain – some of their feeds were almost kind of like a mouthpiece for the Muslim Brotherhood, like Al Jazeera Mubashir in Egypt, for example. Um so you had Al Jazeera, Arabic and English, uh, two different edit, uh, editorial lines, I guess. The Arabic was very blatant in um, in, in some of the stuff. Uh, the English was more measured, and I, I believe it was better journalism and continues to be. Yeah, uh, yeah no, it, it, it definitely. Uh, it's a, it's a great. We we talk a lot on the show about you know looking at uh, different news stories, making sure that you look at it from different sources to, to get closer to the, the truth of the story. And Al Jazeera certainly, um, in their reporting on, on Western affairs, can be uh, a very good uh, check and balance, and, and obviously for, for things that are going on in the Middle East as well. They will give a, a different uh, viewpoint to what you will get in the mainstream press in the UK, for example. Well, it's it's always a good idea to. I mean, I I actually have, was 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 in a meeting earlier today with uh, with a Norwegian newspaper for for, for which I write, uh, and you know one thing that we said in the meeting is that it's a good idea to burst your bubble always. So it's actually a good idea for someone who reads the Guardian to once in a while read something in in Breitbart, and vice versa. Uh, so it's always a good idea to actually diversify your kind of uh, you know your news diet. Yeah, deliberately, deliberately uh, preventing yourself from ending up in the echo chamber, right? Absolutely. Uh, but there's also this other factor, which is Al Jazeera in particular, is uh, there's a completely different voice if you compare the Arabic and the English. And I think this is, uh, this is probably an interesting uh, phenomenon that uh, might also exist in other publications. Uh, so the, the, the English was quite measured, but the Arabic was kind of, slowly not not even slowly but you know you know very surely becoming almost a mouthpiece of the muslim brotherhood and the muslim brotherhood uh, um, was the most organized group uh, after 2011 and that's why they managed to actually win some elections um so of course the 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 kind of the axis that fought back the arab spring was made especially made uh, particularly of the governments of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. These are the guys who funded, for example, uh, the Egyptian army, uh, funded uh, Sisi before he became president Sisi, uh, not to mention, of course, uh, intervening uh, in internal militia dynamics in Syria, in Libya, and of course, intervening in Bahrain, which was one of their first intervention, uh, crushing, you know, helping the government crush the uprising over there. Uh, and of course, also intervening in Yemen, which is an ongoing uh, uh, war uh, with, you know, really a humanitarian cat catastrophe, a catastrophe over there. But it all, really, all goes back to their attempt to uh, roll back the Arab Spring. Um, and these were their guys, you know, like, you know, Sisi was their guy, Haftar, for example, in Libya was their guy. Um, so this is where it comes back to. It, go it goes back to Qatar's perceived support of the Arab Spring. And Al Jazeera's perceived uh, support of the Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, versus uh, these governments who basically, in the name of quote unquote stability and anti terrorism, uh, really want to crush any kind of change, whether it is by Islamists or even by non Islamist or even secular activists. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. You, you, you know, like Saudi women recently won the right to drive, right? Yes. Um, so in uh, I, I don't remember the year, I think maybe it was 2014. I think it was 2014 that two Saudi women activists um, uh, defied the, the, uh, the, the, the driving ban. And they actually drove all the way from the United Arab Emirates across the border into their own country, into Saudi Arabia. Um, and they were arrested, of course, uh, for flouting the ban. But guess what they were uh, accused of? I mean, what 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 were they accused of, and uh, under what charges or under what law were they uh, were they uh, tried? Terrorism law. They were accused of terrorism. 
because any kind of promotion of social change is called terrorism in Saudi Arabia. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's a, a subversive, a subversive idea to to to, to cast anything which goes against the uh, which goes against the government. Okay. So, so even atheism, I mean, promotion of atheism is actually also classified ter- as terrorism in Saudi Arabia. So, so my question then would be, do you see uh, the manoeuvring against Qatar, which happened uh, in December uh, twenty sixteen? Are, are we are we looking at on the timeline there? It was to what just uh, not long after Trump had had came into power. So yeah, it would have been it would have been November December twenty sixteen. Do you see that as uh, opportunism because they thought they had a supportive president in the US, or do you think there was um, another factor which sparked off uh, some sort of intervention? No, I, I think they wanted Trump to win uh, even before he he won. Uh, I think they preferred him, they clearly preferred him to Hillary. Um, and I think that it was really about, again, as I said, uh, and maybe as Bannon said, using him as a blunt instrument. I think that eventually they really wanted to create or recreate this kind of golden or honeymoon period of the Bush years. And they thought that, you know, now that, you know, if we get Trump in, we can do anything we want. We can actually use him against our enemies. Yeah, so so potentially that was something that they had wanted to do for eight years, perhaps. But Obama was in charge, and, and it wouldn't have been a good time. As soon as they had the opportunity, they took it. Yeah, and they really hated the Obama years. I mean, they felt that, especially with the Iran deal, and they they felt that really Obama kind of really let them down. And uh, can I ask? Because I've I've seen it suggested in in, in some sources that I've read that um, Carter's decision to uh, begin developing the the largest gas field in the world, which they share rights to with Iran, was another influencing factor on this. Do you do you buy that? Um, not quite, because uh, keep in mind that these the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, both of them are extremely rich. Uh, they don't have to worry about money for a very long time. Uh, of course, Saudi Arabia is a little bit more. They they have like cash problems, and uh, the new whiz kid, uh, what's his name, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the young millennial kind of crown prince, uh, he is really championing himself as this guy who's going to make Saudi Arabia sustainable economically again. But as for the UAE, they kind of, uh, I, I think, of course, there is an economic incentive always. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, kleptocracy is the, you know, the business, the business model of dictatorship. Uh, but I believe that their survival instinct, if you kind of, kind of create kind of a Maslow's hierarchy for dictators, then of course, survival is going to come before profit. And I think for them, for this, for them, this is really about survival. It's about ensuring alignment and ensuring that Qatar, uh, the last kind of uh, possible or potential threat uh, to their narrative uh, is gone. And if you actually, if you, re- if you remember, and I think we're going to come to that, but when, when they, um, when they gave the demands to Qatar after the Qatar crisis, uh, the top demand was shutting down Al Jazeera. Yes, I do remember that. Yeah, we actually we covered it on an episode. Yeah. So, uh, so that brings us on to, I guess, we're moving in towards the the sacking of Rex Tillerson. Then, and uh, there was obviously there there was a, a bit of a, a, a his commentary. Uh, Rex Tillerson personally on the Qatar crisis yeah. and his his position on it uh, jarred somewhat with the things that the the president was saying on Twitter and in in the public eye, right? Yeah, I mean, so so uh, I, I should point out that in April uh, 2017, this was one uh, one month before uh, Trump's visit to Riyadh and one month before the Qatar the Qatar crisis. Uh, it appears that Jared Kushner actually approached Qatar and asked for money to bail out one of his businesses. And so, do you do you view that as a, sorry, to cut you off? But do you, do you view that as an, a, an attempt, perhaps, at extortion? Do you think that he's 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 kind of intimated to Qatar that look, there's there's maneuvering against you here, but we don't need to necessarily support it. But we're going to have to have our palms greased in some way. I think that Qatar um, already knew that something is in the works. Uh, maybe they didn't expect something as blatant. Uh, 
and again, there, there, there might be. Keep in mind that dictatorships are generally uh, quite uh, opaque. They aren't trans. They're, they're not transparent at all. So sometimes we actually only know the details much, much later. Uh, democracies, on the other hand, there is this uh, uh, demand for uh, transparency. So this is why it's actually more likely that we'll actually find a lot of what was going on behind the works, behind the scenes, from the Mueller, Mueller investigation than from anything that Qatar or the UAE or Saudi Arabia leak. Uh, but it seems to me that it really tells you something about the character of the Trump regime, uh, that it's full of people who are corruptible. And this is something which is good for dictators. Of course, Qatar at the time refused the, the offer. They did not want to, like, they basically turned it down. Uh, and it on, and then the next month you had you know the Qatar crisis start. So there's there's circumstantial evidence there that per- perhaps yeah that that Trump and his uh, team were trying to use that to their advantage. I guess yeah, circumstantial evidence, especially that you know he actually did not. I mean, it it, it seemed that it was not a Trump business; it was a Jared Kushner business. Uh, yeah, but I, th- I think it's I think it's important to to point out that you know uh, it's. It's normal for a president to put all of his business interests into a blind trust mm-hmm. to be to be ran by somebody else throughout his tenure as president. The people in charge of Trump's blind trust are Jared and Ivanka, and they are working in the White House every Absolutely. day. It's not, it's not, that, that is not a blind trust. And I, I, I almost feel like Trump either does not understand what a, what a blind trust is or he doesn't or he pretends not to understand. Yeah, he's been willfully ignorant now. Yeah. So you had, I mean, coming back to Tillerson, so what happened is that right after Trump leaves Riyadh, in, uh, this was in late May 2017, uh, that's when the Qatar crisis started. And the way that the, the Qatar crisis started is that, I mean, these guys really got to work immediately. They kind of got Trump's buy-in and they, 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 they want to work. And what happened is that there was this enormous hack of Qatar's news agency, which planted fake news. Uh, which uh, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia then use as a pretext to cut relations with Qatar. Uh, and the CIA later, I mean, later on, the CIA actually released information saying that this hack, of course, what they said is that, oh, the Qatar is saying uh, so and so and so. I think the Qatar, Qatar was kind of praising the Iranian regime or something like that. Uh, so they used that as a pretext, but it turns out that it was the work of Russian hackers who were paid by the UAE. So what they did is that they hacked uh, Qatar's uh, 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 news agency, planted information, and then used that information that they planted to go after Qatar. Uh, yeah, I've actually seen it suggested in some places that Cambridge Analytica or uh, an SEL affiliated uh, company might have been involved in wow. some of that work as well. Wow, well, I'm... I'm, I'm... I wouldn't be surprised, but you know, I'm hearing it for the first time. Uh, but yeah, so this is how the the crisis started, and you saw a lot of countries um, um, cutting ties with Qatar. There is even leaks, uh, even though I, I don't know uh, as to their credibility, but there are leaks suggesting that a military intervention was in the works, and it was only preempted when uh, Qatar managed to actually get uh, uh, Turkish troops on its own soil. Um, and it seems that, you know, that's what, uh, you know, if, if we want to buy that story that there was a, an actual military intervention in the, in the works, I wouldn't be surprised if there was, but I, I'm not sure if I, uh, if I could say that that's confirmed. Uh, but let's get back to how Trump reacted versus how Tillerson reacted. So Tillerson was kind of trying to be the responsible uh, for, like, you know, like a state secretary, and he's trying to say we have to de-escalate the crisis and he's trying to say that you know the U.S. has a has a has a very important uh, military base in Qatar, so you know this is again this is a matter of U.S. security as well. Trump, on the other hand, at the same time was kind of tweeting messages uh, against Qatar and kind of like very clearly kind of saying that you know this is you know let them do whatever they want. And uh, there there are lots of reports at the time showing how like really U.S. diplomats uh, and Tillerson him, himself they were like really annoyed that Trump is, you know, kind of like undermining their own efforts to to mediate. Yeah, I, I know that Tillerson famously uh, is, is known to have called Trump a moron during his tenure as the Secretary of State. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one, th- one other thing that the UAE at the time also used was um, 
they kind of complete. They use this as an opportunity to completely dominate. The, you know, like uh, Dubai has this uh, media city called Dubai Media City, which is uh, kind of like it's really adjacent to Dubai Internet City. So it's kind of like a free zone, which allowed uh, international uh, uh, news stations to kind of uh, 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 operate, including Sky News and Al Arabiya and uh, you know uh, Al An TV, etc. What what we saw around that time is that they all started repeating word to word UAE narrative. Uh, like it's almost as if these these uh, TV stations either were threatened or co opted or somehow they became mouthpieces of the UAE government, even though they're supposed to be uh, independent. And this kind of tells you something about what uh, what the UAE and Saudi Arabia would like Al Jazeera to look like. They would like it to to look like just another you know. Um, uh, news uh, channel that kind of repeats what it's kind of like another state TV. Uh, so they use that, and at the same at the same time in Saudi Arabia, you saw uh, Mohammed bin Salman deposing. He at the time he was the deputy crown prince. He wasn't the crown prince, and what he did after uh, after the you know around the same I think in June, uh, which was the same month as the Qatar crisis, uh, he deposed the uh, he managed to get of course the father uh, his father is actually the, the king. So he basically managed to complete his control, and he kind of managed to sideline the crown prince, who his, his name is Mohammed bin Nayef, and he became the crown prince and can, kind of like he he was already the, the the de facto ruler, but he managed to actually uh, 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 remove the last obstacle to him becoming the king. So they they used the crisis very very well. They used Trump really well. Yeah, well, I've. Uh... I don't know if you've if you've read uh, Michael Flynn, uh, sorry Michael Wolf's book, the the fire and the fury about the yeah. you know the the yeah. Fir- yeah. So uh, intimates in in the book that the Mohammed bin Salman is uh, and Jared Kushner have a very very close relationship. So he's potentially uh, been instrumental in 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 having this influence on on you know suggesting that that Tillerson's not good for uh, for what they want to do going forward. Yeah, and uh, I think it, it was mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, U.S. investigators are kind of talking about, you know, like when when Jared Kushner, uh, his security clearance in the White House was uh, was was degraded. Uh, yeah. And the reason was given that, you know, he's quite corruptible. And uh, again, his corruptibility, if you want to actually look at his corruptibility, you really need to look at uh, his relationship with Saudi Arabia and Qatar and uh, and. Uh, 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 the United Arab Emirates and how they played him or they attempted to play him. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I don't don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, cast aspersions on Jared Kushner for the sins of his father, but Charlie Kushner has a a, a very well publicised history of corruption. He's yeah. done jail time. Hmm. Yeah, and and you wouldn't be surprised that you know they they kind of run uh, Kushner runs in the same circle, and we've seen that. Uh, there is, if not corruption, then corruptibility. Definitely, yeah. So at, at that time, uh, Tillerson, again, he's trying to defuse the crisis. And the, uh, you know, Trump does not have a very long attention span. So after a few weeks, Trump was no longer kind of taking this very, very aggressive anti qatar stance. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Tillerson made several uh, visits to to the region, trying to de- to to de-escalate. Uh, and of course, the UAE and Saudi Arabia were very very clear. It was very clear from their messaging that they had absolutely no interest in um, any kind of um, uh, de-escalation. In fact, they wanted to escalate more. And uh, it was released. It was revealed in October 2017 that the UAE, UAE lobbyists were already. This was in October 2017 that they were already trying to get Rex Tillerson fired uh, because they were really annoyed with his efforts to de-escalate the crisis. Yeah, um, and obviously that. I saw uh, reported in the mainstream media in the kind of run up to a, a number of key meetings that that Trump was supposed to be having with the the heads of state from Saudi Arabia, uh, from the UAE, and from Qatar. That it, basically the mainstream media in the US seemed to expect that the escalation was on the cards and that this was going to be the major talking point. Yeah, and that, that's what I thought as well. When I when I saw that, you know, like all three of them are going to be visiting Trump, UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, I thought that that's what's in the works. What's in the works is basically, you know, kind of the, 
official de-escalation. And that's why it was kind of a master stroke that Tillerson is fired a week before Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed are supposed to visit Trump. Yeah, because it, uh, it, it really it boosts relations uh, at a crucial time. Just before the meeting, you know, we've, we have seen that uh, when Mohammed bin Salman came to the UK, he was, uh, you know, treated uh, with uh, like a, a kind of propaganda um, welcome you know we were we had billboards we had TV, television adverts about how Saudi Arabia was becoming a progressive country etc cetera, etc cetera. and then bang the, in the in the days after he leaves we we announced that we're, we're making 48 uh, fighter jets worth billions for for Saudi Arabia so um, obviously uh, it's a it's a lucrative business to keep these people happy yeah and he did the same thing with uh, with uh, with the United States I mean he met Trump yesterday I believe and again, I mean, the, the 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 clip is there. I I just saw it where Trump is basically looking, uh, basically listing everything that Mohammed bin Salman has bought. Uh, and of course, the 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 message he's saying is that you know, uh, so long they they're buying, we're gonna keep selling. In fact, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something even more blatant. Uh, there was there's this uh, uh, UAE academic who's very close to. Um, the, the the leadership of the United Arab Emirates, and he's active on Twitter. And he tweets today, this is this tweet, I think, no, this tweet is yesterday, I believe. Uh, and he tweets, America is up for sale and the Gulf countries have the price. So it's totally blatant. Yeah, and I, 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 we can we we can see it happening before our eyes. Uh, just just in relation to the uh, to what I was saying earlier about the possibility of, of Cambridge Analytica having been involved in the in the hacking, um, something that was brought to me today by by one of our listeners is uh, a company called Emerdata, who are registered in the UK. Um, it features two of Eric Prince's partners in. Uh, his frontier company who are based out of Hong Kong, uh, Jennifer Mercer and Rebecca Mercer, Alexander Nix, the CEO of Cambridge Analytica, uh, and also um, a man named Ahmed Al-Khatib, who I believe is a uh, head of the Saudi Arabian military industries, SAMI, um, is, is also uh, a member of, of that company. So there are, it seems potentially there are there are there are backdoor ties between Eric Prince, between the Saudi military, between people, between the Mercers, and between uh, Cambridge Analytica board members. Uh, this is a really interesting angle that I think I want to research after you know uh, um, after our talk. Um, so that I mean I think that that pretty much illustrates to to our listeners uh, exactly where you're coming from. Um, with this thread and, and it's certainly enlightened me as to some of the background of the Qatar crisis and really um, really shines a light on just exactly how damaging the the dictators of these countries view Al Jazeera as a sort of democratic and an uncontrolled certainly voice um, which can speak directly to their citizens and can and can say things that they don't want to be said to their citizens right yeah and I, th I think there is there's another factor also to consider which is that uh, uh, social media became very important in the region and what they we really need to have a look at the uh, you know of course they're annoyed with al jazeera but they're also really really threatened by social media because it gives this uh, this uh, it enables their citizens to you know do what they to 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 speak um well that that brings us on rather nicely to your own personal circumstance in in uh, in the UAE, uh, Iyad. So, uh, in in two thousand and fourteen, was it that you were you were uh, arrested um, for for your uh, for the things that you had been saying on Twitter and sort of promoting democracy in the region? Yeah, I mean. I mean, the interesting thing is that they didn't really uh, point to any particular tweet. I think it's just my general tweet, Twitter activity. Uh, but what they do is that when they cannot take down the, the content, they go after the content creator. Um, so for me, I, I, I actually tell people that I kind of 
out of everything that they could do to a person, expulsion seems to be the most the the least bad option. Uh, because you know, if I was a citizen of the UAE, I would probably be uh, either uh, stripped of citizenship or I end up in uh, in jail for a very very long time. So did you actually, uh, did you spend time in prison in, in, in the UAE? Yeah, I was in prison for a while before they, you know, of course, at the time they said, you have to leave the country, we're expelling you. Uh, but, you know, I'm uh, there's no country they can send me to because I'm a Palestinian, a Palestinian refugee for the, for, you know, for that matter. So I don't actually, I mean, even though I'm Palestinian, uh, uh uh, I, I'm actually I'm not even a citizen, or I don't even have residence in Palestine in the Palestinian territories. Uh, so as a result, there's nobody, there's nowhere to send me. Uh, so for that reason, I ended up uh, in jail for a while before they figured out that, uh, or they get, kind of gave me the option that you could go to Malaysia because Malaysia allows visa-free travel to Palestinians. And of course, I jumped at the first uh, the first opportunity because uh, I was afraid that if I don't if I'm if I don't get out very soon, they will charge me of something more serious, and I'll never get out. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, what was what was your experience of 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 prison there like? Were you were you treated particularly badly, or do you think you uh, were were treated uh, reasonably well in, in comparison to what could have happened to you? Well, the you know it's prison, so nobody's really treated well. But uh, I, I, the impression that I got was that the people who are running the prison did, were not aware that I'm I'm actually there on uh, on political charges, which is why they did not single me out for bad treatment. Um, and I started to feel that uh, as time went by, I run a bigger risk of being discovered as someone who has a political background. And if if that happened, I was afraid that you know the treatment is going to really really uh, worsen. So, so yeah. So you took the opportunity to get to get out while you could. I think you know it, it's it's important to to sort of draw attention to to that kind of behaviour by the by the regime in, in the UAE. Though, uh, you know, we we are we are often uh, it's often discussed in in, in our media um, in the UK, the US, uh, and Western media about. The, the people who we are we are unfriendly with the regimes that we we don't have ties to so you know the human rights abuses of North Korea for example or you know of, of the things which uh, Putin is doing but uh, we we tend to gloss over uh, largely uh, a lot of the human rights abuses and, and things which are happening in, in countries like Saudi Arabia like the UAE which are wholly undemocratic and which you know on the face of it don't uh, don't match up with what, what you know, in inverted commas, Western ideals, um, we're happy to to overlook these things when uh, you know there's monetary gain for for us um, and and in our in our governments over here. Yeah, and I I, th- I think really what really people need to realize is that there is uh, eventually a security cost in the end because what you what money what money the country makes in investments. Uh, it, it's event or you know in weapon sales or whatever it's really paying back collectively in refugee relief in counterterrorism uh, and in fighting wars uh, bombing campaigns uh, not to mention that there is a steep and really serious uh, price to the country's reputation yeah uh, I think I think that's I think that's exactly right and I think that's you know uh, there's definitely a, a higher level of awareness is, is is happening over here. There's a lot of a lot of people talking uh, in very strong terms about the fact that you know we are we're essentially backing up um, the Saudi regime's uh, and and UAE's interference in Yemen. We're selling them weapons which which we know they're going to use to 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 bomb civilians in, in Yemen and, and and like you said earlier cause a massive humanitarian crisis, biggest cholera outbreak in modern times happening over there right now, you know uh, that's not something that we should be we should be supporting or encouraging um, anyway you know, I would like to to really thank you for, for your time Yad. it's been uh, great having you on here as a guest, um, I, I appreciate you, you taking the time to speak to us and I, I hope that um, if we have a relevant topic in the future that we'd we'd be able to, to, to get your your uh, keen insight into Middle East affairs again Well absolutely, I'd be happy to come back on the show 
Uh, we'll uh, obviously, as as we always do, we'll put up all the all the links to all the articles you've discussed and uh, to your own to your own blog and the and, and the affiliated uh, websites which you have. But uh, yeah, yeah. thanks thanks for coming on. I've actually just finished writing a book uh, which kind of touches on, on a lot of these topics. It's called the Vicious Triangle terrorists, tyrants, and the West. And uh, really, it's kind of trying to get a deep dive into uh, into kind of the trap that we have over here where, you know, dictators are using war on terrorism, terrorists are saying that we're fighting tyranny. Uh, and in many cases, the West's influence actually makes things worse. Uh, so we're kind of like write, wrote that book to, to talk about what is an alternative, if, if any. Well, that's that sounds really interesting. We'll uh, we'll we'll put up the we'll put up the link and, and stuff for for our, our listeners to to check that out as well. And yeah, just uh, once again, thanks very much to Ian El Baghdadi. Mm-hmm.